We'll see. We'll see. Okay. So this is. No, we have a very long response. It's yeah. uh, basically. I mean, he, he presented the same arguments in 2008 to the same authority, and the argument was rejected. Uh, so we are very confident that the same thing will happen now. He's a Norwegian. He's a Norwegian lawyer. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. He, he's, I mean, it's very simple. He, he has a purist interpretation of, yeah. of the will, uh -huh. meaning that the price should only go to peace activists, narrowly defined. Yeah. Uh -huh. Narrowly defined. A little bit like our constitutional exactly. interpretation. Exactly, it's the same even, thing. Even biblically. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. There are some <laughs> who are originalists. Yes. Exactly. This is it. This is it. Things do but, not but change. But his problem is yeah. that he got the Nobel in the world. I mean, you get the first understand the Nobel, Nobel in, in the 1890s, uh -huh. as reflected by the fact that the first myth had a different interpretation. Right. Thank you for today. His, his main complaint is that you have not answered his questions. Yeah, yeah. And recently there's an article that, um, that you said, I wish this debate would get over. And his response back, uh, Heffermel's response was, well, I wish it would just start. Uh, I, I have met him on television. We have debated this on television. I, we have debated this in the newspapers. But of course, he will continue. Uh, this, this is his, his, uh, his big cause in his life. So he will never, ever be persuaded, obviously. But we think his uh, understanding of Nobel and Nobel's will is wrong. Uh, he makes Nobel into a very uh, one-dimensional person. No, he was not. As I said with this quotation, my invention will do more for peace than your peace congresses. We think his, his uh, study of, uh, of the laureates uh, who will fall within the will and who will not is extremely inconsistent and illogical. Uh, we think uh, that he... Uh, he uh, his cause is very simple. He wants the price to go to peace activists narrowly defined. And as I suggested with the Pilger argument, he's going willing to go to any length to define these peace activists within the will. What do you say to the one argument, which is obviously you are awarding many prizes for human rights activists and even to include environmental yeah. activism because you say that falls within fraternity of countries. Uh, how do you argue, answer the question that one of the gentlemen a answer, asked about uh, the ability to reduce standing armies and militarization, which is what Heffermel, you know, claims that yes. That is one of Nobel's, and it certainly is one of the three Yes, but missions. he doesn't say a word about nuclear weapons. He, say, he, he talks about standing armies. Right. Uh, so again, even on this point, Hefferman is interpreting the will. We agree with him on this point, because we think okay. standing armies is too narrow. He obviously didn't know about nuclear weapons in 1896. And the Nobel Committee has given many, many awards to those uh, fighting uh, for the reduction or elimination of nuclear weapons. Many. Like and and actually also an award to Obama, who um, you, you're, you know, he tried to reduce some, but... Uh, he established the zero vision, a world without nuclear weapons, which clearly applies. Um, I have a question about the, when you said, um, when you said the, the award is aspirational. So Sometimes, obviously yes. giving it to someone and hoping that their behavior and I think Obama perhaps fit this category, uh, maybe de Klerk did as well. In the session I was in just now, uh, Naomi Tutu uh, said it was premature to give Clerk the award because in effect, he then did not follow through with the reconciliation, um, or at least as authentically as he should have. Here's the, here's the question. If you give an aspirational award, and that's what I asked before, and then the person goes opposite so you're hoping that they don't start wars or, or add to wars or, or even start a nuclear war, for heaven's sakes. And then they do, and, and you can't rescind the award. Does not the award itself lose its integrity? Uh, especially going back to Alfred Nobel's will. Doesn't it actually lose? It becomes so hypocritical because it's like Orwell. You're, you're, you're using... Well, you may think so, but... Uh... 
I think the uh, Oxford Dictionary uh, of Contemporary History, which I uh, quoted, I mean, it says this is the world's most prestigious prize. No, we cannot rescind. There is often an aspirational element, but there cannot, there can, there has to be more. There has to be a basis of achievement. You must have done something, and then you can hope for it. it can be aspirational uh, in addition. And. And you cited what Obama had done in, uh, before he was uh, nominated, or not before he was nominated, but before he was selected. Yes. Uh, and you said it had to be for the preceding year. 2009. But when I, so he, he got the prize for what he had done in 2009. Right. So we had but, almost a full year to uh, evaluate what he had done. Uh, but you began the selection pro process right now in the year, so that would yeah, have yeah, been... Yeah, but we don't make no decision until October. Mm -hmm. But you're weeding people out all along, so from like yeah, yeah, February on? Yeah, we can always on? bring them back. I mean, as long as you have been nominated by the deadline, February 1st, we, you can always be brought back. And this happens frequently, uh, that somebody who were not really evaluated in that first round, he or she was reconsidered later mm -hmm. in the year. Yes, of course. So if I'm, if I'm doing the math right, uh, he, obviously Obama made that first round of selection in February of 2009 when he had really only been in president for no, two, no, no. two uh, months. What I'm saying is that uh, the committee makes it dec uh, its decision when it has to, as late as possible. So mm -hmm. what, what is done uh, earlier in, in, in the year is not necessarily very important. Mm -hmm. So it was an evaluation of where Obama stood at the end of September, early October. And so the preceding year would have been for his campaign promises, at least some, no, no, to some preceding extent? preceding year is from the, the, the previous award in 2008. So this is the period from, from, from January to October 2009. So nine months in office. Okay. I tell all the committee members what they have all done and not done. Um, then the first uh, short list is drawn up, 30, 35 names. Um, Norwegian experts write reports on these 30, 35 names. And I present the reports. Uh, the deadline is February 1st. We have the first meeting at the end of February. We have the next meeting uh, in April when I present the reports. Uh, the committee will then reduce the number considerably to fewer than 10. And then we bring in the international experts. Uh, we, uh, I try to find out who are the experts, the leading experts anywhere in the world uh, on the kind of candidate uh, we're talking about. So we go very quickly from almost 250 and down to five or six. And then we spend much time uh, on these remaining five or six uh, candidates. And the normal situation in the committee will be that three or four of the members support one candidate and one or two will support another candidate. But they will have a majority candidate in second and third place. So you go with the majority and everybody agrees that this is a good candidate. The difficulty arises if the minority cannot accept the majority candidate. And this has happened uh, three times in our 111 year history. The Osietsky Prize, two members left. The Kissinger Minotaur Prize, two members left. And the Adolf Alperis Prize, uh, one member. Uh, and, uh, and the parties in Parliament are represented according to their strength. Uh, so we have uh, members from left to right, uh, and normally uh, we have five, six, uh, seven meetings uh, in a year. I'm just going to ask one more time, uh, which was uh, the one question that Bradley Holt. Um, why are there so few awards given, and, and again, given de Klerk's speech this morning, where he said, uh, we will never get rid of militaries, and it's important to project military force around the world. He said that in his uh, keynote speech. Why are so few awards, and he's in a Nobel awardee, why are so few awards given for that one area of Nobel's will to reduce uh, militarization, especially our military industry? Not, not true. Not true. Uh, I haven't counted, but there are at least 10 prizes uh, for the struggle against nuclear weapons alone. And uh, then we have added landmines. Uh, so not true. No, I, I don't agree with you. We have given many such awards. Okay. 
Um, would you be open to uh, having Frederick Heffermel come to this forum next year? And because uh, you said you've debated him before, and he claims he hasn't been debated. So he's, 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 I mean, he's making himself into a victim. I was on television with him two weeks ago. Yeah. The truth, I, I can, I will be willing to debate him any time because he's ill-informed. I, I find it, it's difficult to debate him because he, for instance, this well-known quote from Nobel's will that my invention will do more for peace than your peace congresses. He had forgotten, or maybe had never known, this is a very obvious and explicit quotation. He thinks this refers to nuclear weapons, which of course is ridiculous. I mean, it's embarrassing to discuss with a person who is so ill-informed. Um, his. Um, I have nothing he, against discussing. He claims with he's him. researched diaries of some of the yeah, committees yeah, yeah, I know. from. He has, he has researched the diaries, but I, I, I would just give you one example. I find it so embarrassing because he, he has read the diary of a, the committee chairman, Gunnar Jan, and he says that, that Jan basically agrees with him, which is total nonsense because the prize Gunnar Jan was the proudest of was the prize, the Human Rights Prize to Gutule. And he has, he doesn't know this. I mean, it's very embarrassing to discuss with a person who thinks he and Gunnar Jan has identical opinions when the prize Gunnar Jan liked the most was a prize which Heffermel is totally opposed to. It's embarrassing. I mean, I have to stand there and tell him, you're an ignorant man. You haven't even studied this. I mean, he, he, he's so selective. He picks and chooses a phrase here and a, chase, and a phrase there. I have read Gunnar Jan's papers, Oops. and in no way do they su support him. So I have nothing against debating him, but my wife tells me all the time, you shouldn't debate him because you come across as arrogant when you point out all these ridiculous assertions. And I'll give you one example. One, one of the leading human rights uh, person who received the prize was René Cassin, the father of the UN Human Rights Declaration, René Cassin. In the Swedish edition, which Hefemir has then submitted to the authorities, he doesn't even, it's very obvious from his notes, he has no idea who René Cassin is because he says in his notes that he was an Italian partisan during World War II. He doesn't even know who the father of the UN Human Rights Declaration is and he thinks he was an Italian partisan. I mean, I, I can debate him any time. Okay. Well, but it, it's, I mean, I, it's, uh, it's, be, be, the, it's so ridiculous. I mean, his ignorance is so vast. Yeah, uh, um, leaving Heffermel to the side, you know, personally, because well, you I'm, brought him up. I'm a peace activist and human you rights, him up. and I didn't. Uh, human rights, and uh, actually, you know, I, I I can kind of see where the the uh, rationale now for but war. These people, they don't agree with him. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of it, I mean, I, I know many of his friends, and they think the prices for human rights are fine. Well, here's one, and this will be the last question because I think they're going to start. Um, the one really strong question here about human rights, you said human rights, democracy, and peace are all closely linked. Now, the, the problem with that is the, the bombing the village to save it type argument, the utilitarian argument. They now are really rationalizing many wars based on humanitarian intervention. And so you say, I'm trying to, to bring this peace is, through this war. This is not what we're saying. But if you, if you, if you look at the studies of, of peace researchers and political scientists, they, they, are, they are not supporting. I mean, the, 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 this does not mean that you necessarily support uh, the Bush policy on Iraq. It, it's just stating that there is a, a, a positive relationship as found in many, many studies that there is a, a connection between human rights, democracy, and peace. It does not mean that you should start bombing countries into democracy. No. But you, if you know. But anything, that is the, the danger because it's it's obviously used a lot. So, anyways, appreciate you. appreciate very much your. Thank you.